you get a chance, get a one of these three leaf. Um, these are really introductions to what you believe here, or what we believe here as a church. Really good. Shows us our vision. It shows us all the good things that we're doing. Okay. I want to our lesson for today is maintaining a healthy walk. The truth about maintaining a healthy walk. Now, how many here, let me just kind of give me a nod, believe that God gave us everything and done everything for us so that then he could come and help us fulfill the real plan that he has for us. In other words, God has made a way. In fact, Jesus said, I am the life, I am the truth, and I am the way, right? Way, truth, and the life. I said it in reverse. All right, so good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. It's good to see your hearts. It's good to see the light shining off your face. It's great. Amen. So we're going to study today and have some great fun on how to maintain a good, healthy walk. So look at, at somebody and kind of stare at them and say, pay attention. No. <laughs> All right. Go with me to John chapter 3. Will you? John chapter 3, the book of John. We're going to look at a religious man named Nicodemus and what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And as you do that, can we have my scripture up? We can pop it right back up. You notice some of you seen it? There it is. Here's the key to every, when the word comes forth, this is the key. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear, listen to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life. To those who find them, listen to this next phrase, and help to all their flesh. You want to stay healthy, you have to be in the word every day. And just a little bit, not something about the word, the word. Can you say amen? And in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Isaiah 66 says, whom to God look, he looks to the one who has a contrite spirit and trembles at his word. Jeremiah said, I love your word more than my necessary food. Job cried out and said, I'd rather have your word than your commandments. And yet, it seems like in this day and hour that we're living, the church has moved off of the word into more opinion, criticalness about things, and we just literally, I think, almost corporately been deceived to get away from the word of God. Look and smile at somebody and say, get in the word. All right. So John chapter 3, let's look at verse 1, please. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Who, we, who was he? A ruler of the Jews. This guy's supposed to know his stuff. Okay, that's what I want to give you. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs. Everyone say signs. Signs, there's everywhere a sign. Blocking up the scenery, blowing your mind. Do this, do that. Can't you read the signs? Well, one of the things I want to say to you, is the Jews seek after a what? And the Gentiles or the Greeks seek wisdom. But what God has is his son. <laughs> and so this religious man is missing the point. Because remember they were brought up as Jews, wonderful people. But they were brought up in the works of the law. For they had no revelation of who the Messiah actually was. Because we know that when Jesus showed up. They crucified him. My word. Strange people. Not Jewish. Just everybody. How we want to destroy things we don't understand. Moving right along. Okay. Now he's a ruler of the Jews. He's a teacher. And Jesus said to him. Most assuredly. Now what did he ask? Nobody could do these signs unless God be with you. 
So what did Jesus say to him? Now look at what Jesus said. Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot, see that little word see? It means perceive and understand. You cannot perceive or understand the kingdom of God. So for you and I to understand real spiritual matters, what must we do first? Get born again. Now I know you did, all right? But what, there's a lot of people that shook the preacher's hand and tapped the priest on the back, took a communion, but they've never asked Jesus to come and dwell in their heart to forgive them of their sin. You must be born again for your spiritual eyes to open and to see the plan and the kingdom of God. Someone say amen. amen. Now, listen to what Nicodemus, now remember Nicodemus is a teacher, a leader of the Jews. So Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say unto you, unless... One is born of water and of the spirit. Now there's a real, I've seen people get so hung up on this. Being born of water would represent what? Natural birth. You come out of a sack of water. Now that's not all it means. It means more than that. How many know, have you, how many seen that little, Joe got this a long time ago. It's a little shower thing on a stick out there. I painted it all, made it look good. And there's going to be a little sign that says, you are now washed by the water of the word. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it, but I thought, hey, why not? Everything, well, I want them to be a reminder of our relationship with God. Anyway, going back, you see, Jesus stood at that one day of the feast, remember? And he said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Water is a symbolization of the anointing and the power of God. But in this case, it's talking about being born naturally and being born spiritually. So let's read it again. So he says, how can I, this be? And he said, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless you are born of water, natural birth, and of the spirit, he cannot what? Enter. Enter. Folks, you got to understand this. Everyone say kingdom. What's the one? Let me, I'm asking you a question now. What's the one place Satan can't go? Into the kingdom of God. Hello. God stop him. Every time. You dwell in the kingdom. But he can't come in the kingdom. Unless he calls you out. Hey Carrie. Nobody loves you. You got people that are mad at you. And so Carrie just, oh, why, why? Next thing I know, I move out my mentalness and my thinking. Now I am not dwelling about God and being filled and praying for them. Now I'm dwelling on why, why, oh, why? Me, oh, me. You get it? Satan's a big deceiver and a blowhard. So don't let him blow hard on you. All right, moving on. How can these things be? He says, that which is born of the flesh, natural births. Now he clarifies in verse six. So I believe that when Jesus spoke the word over them in the, in the, in, in just in the last supper, remember? He says, now you're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. Because the word is water. It's like water. And so the word shall come down like rain and snow and water the earth. And it shall not Return unto God, boy, so will accomplish in you what he wants. So, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Everyone say, I got them both. You're born in the flesh, which gives you a right to be a human. And you're born in the spirit because you got reborn in the Lord. Can you say amen? Now look what he says. Okay. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and lists, and you can hear the sound of it, and you can tell, you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. Now he says this. Nicodemus answered and said, How can these things be? Do you see the problem? Here's a really good religious man. He is so good that he recognizes that Jesus is a teacher from God. Yet because of his religious teaching, he had no idea the importance of walking and moving with God in the realm of the Spirit. 
Do you? In order for us to maintain a healthy walk, we've got to do some things. Just some little things that God requires us. And the, the fact is that some of us, and I'm just saying generally, don't do them. And we wonder why we go through what we do. Remember, I want, as a pastor, my wife and I want you to get it. We want you to have a great time. We want you to prosper. We want you to be in health. Amen? Even as your soul prospers. So we're going to give you word, the word of God for you to meditate and partake of so that you can have a healthy walk. Say amen! Well, gee, Carrie, I now feel like you're on my side. You know, people come to church and they think the pastor's picking on them all the time. Don't be that way. My goodness, I'm your friend, right? But I'm also your pastor. All right. Okay, so a couple points I want to give you. Once we become born again, we are relit. Everyone say relit. You see, when you were first born, God already purposed and planned a wonderful walk for you. But because Adam and Eve fell, that plan was interrupted. But God's plan has never stopped concerning you. It's always been good. It's always been blessed. He wants you to fulfill that walk. And so in order to do that, you've got to do some basic things. You've got to be with God long enough for him to tell you what you should be doing. We have a general word. We, we see it in there. And we, we need to be then led of the Spirit of God so that he could guide us in the specifics of our walk with him in our life. Amen? It says that we have a race to run. No one else can run. And we're in com competition. But we're in competition to what? You're in competition with your flesh. Your flesh wants to go left and your spirit wants to go right. Which one is winning? Here's the answer. The one you feed the most. Because <laughs> you are a, a fleshly person. You have a, a flesh suit. And you are a spiritual person has God in it. We know which way we should be going. But how many know that we need to do that with God's help? Can't do it on our own. How many's ever heard these terms? I'm really working hard to please God. Nah. Never going to make it. You're going to wear yourself out. Because you're before God. So you're working hard. Don't get before God. Keep God out in front. I'm going to say it again. Don't get before God. Don't get in front of him. Don't tell God how you think about things. He knows. Let Push him out in front and let him lead you. We're yoked with Jesus, aren't we? Aren't we yoked? That means Jesus takes the lead in us who need to learn the routines of life. Must learn being yoked up with Christ as he walks us through until we get it. Say amen, someone. Our shepherd will lead us into green pastures, still waters, will restore our soul. And even though we be in the valley of the shadow of death, fallen earth, fallen earth, we will fear no evil, for God is with us. Say amen. All right, so look at this too. We now are a new creation, a new man, a new creature. God lives in us. Now, I need to take the time to explain it because we have people coming in all the time from the camera. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Okay? God expects now to listen to him inside of you. So, when God comes in you, he pulls out the sin nature from your spirit, pulls out the fallen satanic nature that goes along with the sin nature, and places his spirit inside you. And then if you can imagine. You mix a little coffee. You mix a little sugar. Mix a little cream or tea. Whatever you use. Put it in the shaker and go. And you can't separate the liquids. Unless you have a good science on it. So guess what. That's what God did to you. When you asked Jesus to forgive you. And to come into your heart. God was just standing there waiting. He come right on in. He eradicated all the negativity out of your spirit. 
Now you need to get in the Word so you can renew your mind from the bad programming. And then you need to get into the Word. See, the Word's not for your spirit. It only helps your spirit to massage it so it can expand up through the eyes of your understanding. The Word was written for your brain so you have the right thinking. Can you say amen? And if without the right thinking, we can resist even the best will of God. Because we have a human will that can resist or it can open up. Say amen, somebody. And then thirdly, remember, being born again, everything that God did was for you. And God is with you. So I'm going to give you four things. You need to write them down real quickly. Did you know that about two-thirds of the church doesn't realize that God is for them? Was the scripture say, if God be for us, who could be against us? Did you know a lot of people think God's their problem? Two, how many here know Emmanuel means God is with us? So not only is God for us, but he's with us. God has always been wanting to tabernacle among human beings. Not only is he with us, but he's in us. Let me show you the mystery of God and Christ in us. The hope of glory. Right? Now think about these things. Remember, your mind needs some help. You are really, really taken care of. But the enemy doesn't want you to know that. You are so well taken care of. It's because of what we don't know sometimes. We get into trouble or we're mistaught in an area that we open a door we shouldn't. Now, not only is God in us, but here's the big deal. You're in God. Oh, Hey, what is the devil in? He's in a big mess. He's very, very irritated. He's very, very much a criminal. And guess what? You and I are God's children shining and glorifying God right in his face. And as long as we stay in God, he can touch you. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, go ahead. You go get touched. <laughs> Just treat the devil as a child molester. And that will help you not to allow him next to you. All right? Let's move on. A couple of scriptures I want to give you. Say, born again. God dwells in me. I dwell in God. And he has set me free. All right, let me give you this scripture. It's in Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. I'm going to read it rather quickly. And then we're going to go to Colossians chapter 3. Don't worry, I'll read them to you so you're okay. Remember what we said about uh, uh, note-taking and all? We do have sets of notes for several of you, okay? All right, so Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, aren't you glad? Because of his great love wherewith he has loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and in sins. Made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. And raised us up. Everyone say we've been raised up. And made us sit together with who? Jesus Christ. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So I told you last week, you're sitting here, but you're sitting there. You're sitting here, but you're sitting there. Now are you... Going to fight the devil with what's sitting here? Or are you going to fight the devil from the authority that Jesus already gave you? And he already won the battle. Did you know that Jesus already kicked the devils and smashed him so bad? But he's, he's still walking around. Yeah, seeking whom he may deceive. Thank God you're not volunteering. Amen. All right, so listen to this. Colossians 3. It says, you're risen with Christ, sitting with him in heavenly places. Say amen. Now listen to Colossians 3. I know these are good scriptures. I use them a lot. If you were raised with Christ, and you are, seek those things which are above. The key word there is seek. Seek means to constantly desire after or crave after. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. If you crave after God, God will start meeting your needs. If you get craving after what? Meeting your own needs. Then God will just wait until you're wore out. 
Because he doesn't want you claiming that you are all that. He wants you claiming that God is all that. And so he's going to bless your socks right off you. Or maybe give you a whole more pair. <laughs> you see, when God blesses his children, everybody knows it's him. But when we bless ourselves because of God, then Satan has an accusation against us. Just think about that. Let's move on. So, set your, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Just tells you. Don't dwell on earthly things too much. Amen? Dwell on heavenly things. Be heavenly minded. You're much earthly good. All right. First point. Our God is a consuming fire. Good to see, bro. Matthew 3, verse 11, please. That was all introduction, so let's... <laughs> oh, man, you guys are wonderful. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is during John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. So you know. But he mentions that our God is a fire. Okay? And the reason why I want to give you is I want you to get a revelation, an understanding that God in you is a consuming fire. He only consumes your flesh and your carnality. But he burns in your spirit and makes it pure. Okay? So whenever the devil tries to hand you a lie, if you release God, he'll burn it up. So he's your torch coming out of your mouth. Out of your actions. Hello. And what is one thing Satan is absolutely terrified of? Is the light. Doesn't fire give light? It illuminous. It's illuminous, right? And certain fires, if you mix with torches and stuff, are brighter and duller. Orange and then go into blue and white. You know, you see what I'm saying? God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So that consuming fire in you is very, very important that it stays burning. Say amen. Be a wise virgin. Trim your lamps and let your lights burn. All right. So it goes on and he says, Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am unworthy to carry. Look at, I got to hiccup, sorry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. All right, let me say to you, God's in your heart a consuming burning fire. He burns up sin. He burns up carnality. He helps change your flesh and he's burning in you. Now, one of the questions I was asked, well, then does the fire of God in our heart ever go out? No. God never goes out. He's never lost anything. So we always, as human beings, we always look fire over here. And that's a type of God. And then God over here. And they're just, no, they're not. They're the same. Your God is a burning fire. Who do you think Moses saw up in the mountain when he looked at the burning bush? I'll tell you what. He saw the all-consuming fire of God. And he saw it as a bush because every branch had to do with every part of God's creation. He was showing Moses a map of his original being. There wasn't a fallen branch. There wasn't no fallen Lucifer. He was showing, this is the entire thing, Moses. And he said, well, turn it off. So your God is a fire. Now, let me give you one more scripture. Oh, thank you, Jesus. All right. Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 28 and 29. How many here know that we're in the kingdom? The kingdom of God, right? Came at Pentecost, right? Can Satan go into the kingdom? No. So you want the kingdom to 
stuck all around you. Can you say amen? You're citizens of the kingdom. You're children of God. Your father is almighty God. He looked to and fro and he said, I have found no other. He is your father. Doesn't that just thrill you? And even though you be in the earth, you're not of the earth. And you are dwelling in a kingdom where a king rules and reigns. Now let him rule and reign in your life. Sounds good to me. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Therefore, we said, so this is verse 28, okay, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are receiving, see the word receiving is a continual thing. A kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace by which we serve God acceptably. God will not receive your flesh. Even the greatest efforts you do in the flesh is not ever going to meet God. But the simplest little things you do from your spirit, you have God's attention. Because he created you a spirit being, not a flesh being. That's why it's an insult to God for you to work hard to please him. I'm just working really hard and praying really hard so my walk is really, really strong. Stop! You're deceived already. But your intentions are good. Don't get yourself and your labors ahead of Jesus. Can you say amen? Sit down with him. Let him work. Okay? As long as you're working, he rests. As long as you're resting, he works. So which one do you want to be? Now, I'm not saying laziness here. Because we have people that need to go out and, and do things. But when you do, take the rest to God with you. All right. Move on. Thank you, Pastor Kerry. All right. I, I'm, I'm so fired up. Of it. I mean, I'm telling you, the anointing is really strong all morning long. So if I get kind of goofy, that's what happens to me. Who knows? We might have a laughing fest. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is our what? All right. Don't forget that. All right. So, all right. So he says, look, we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and having grace by which we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now we know God. So let me, let me talk to you. So, well, how many ever had a fireplace in your home? Remember back in the day? Maybe a pellet stove or something that you actually used. When I lived in South Prairie for seven years, I had a wood stoke stove that leaked smoke. And we had a great time. You know, the, the, the more you wanted the heat in the fireplace, what did you do? You added more fuel. And if you were like me, white man buildeth big fire and get him burned. Indian build him small fire and get him close and get him warm. <laughs> I mean, I've done all kinds of things. I threw accelerant in there one time and blew. <laughs> I looked like Scott. I mean, everything was burned off and everything. But just, just let me show you. God is a beautiful consuming fire that will only consume Satan and his group consume sin and the carnality of the bad thinking that we have. So we want to stoke the fire in our heart. Well, I thought God just burns on his own. No, he's dwelling in you. You're the fireplace, honey. Now, what are you putting in there? What are you shoveling in? <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> what are, are you a junk food Christian? <laughs> I'm telling you we all right oh don't look get me started on this okay so a couple of points I want to give you now that we are born again we have almighty God inside us like a fire burning consuming anything that's negative of our flesh carnality it's literally helping our thinking it's just consuming in us all the fallen nature aren't you glad so everybody, look within yourself and take a big deep breath and go, <laughs> get that thing going. Two, I'm just kidding with you. Two, the fire of God in us must be fed fuel. 
We're going to show you what the fuel is here shortly. The fire of God in us never goes out, but is dimmed when our flesh encloses our, our behavior. The fire is still in there, burning away, but our flesh, if we feed it, will literally come up and start like a wet blanket, start shutting down that fire. Now God, because he's a gentleman, he will step back and say, I'll have to wait till you're finished. This little tantrum, I hope it doesn't last for a week or two. You know, I'm not picking on anybody, but the idea is, is as long as the enemy can keep us all involved about ourselves, trying to help God, we're going to be so frustrated. And I don't want you to have that. I want you to have a healthy walk. Can you say amen? So, let's find about stoking this fire. Can you say amen? Well, point one. To stoke the fire, we have to meet with the fire. Folks, you're never going to get around this. This is what is lacking in the church of Jesus Christ worldwide. The ones that are serving God in the third world countries where the pressures are so hard and they're believing for their food, they always have to meet with God. But over here in America, some of our us spoiled nations, we run to the medicine cabinet before we run to the Lord. Now, I'm not picking on any of us. So we have to develop a habit with God's help to meet with a boss. How many's ever worked for somebody and never did tell you what they wanted and they're always on their case because you never did anything that they wanted right and they've never told you your job description? Well, that would be stupid, wouldn't it? Instead, we meet with our boss. We meet with our Lord, our Father, and he gives us our instructions. He's a consuming fire, so we plug in. So the first thing to a healthy walk is your prayer life. Can you say amen? Meeting with our Father first. Everyone say priorities. Who's first in your life? Well, we like to say God, and I'm not putting anybody down. So God should be first in our life. That means before you go out and make a decision, buy a house, go on a vacation, you seek your Heavenly Father how He feels about it. Well, what if he tells me I'm not going to have a vacation? You see how you're thinking? Get your mind in line. Your Heavenly Father is not an abuser. You are. That's why you think that way. <laughs> you abuse yourself. Come on. Look at me with a smile. Amen. All right. So, listen to this. We've got to meet with our Father first. So, Hebrews 11.6 says this. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Now listen. And that he's a rewarder of those who constantly seek him. Or diligently seek him. Say amen. And here's a scripture God wants me to give to Scott. Scott, Matthew 6.6 6 says. But when you pray, go into your closet and shut the door. And pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees you in the secret place shall reward you openly. I had a little intercessor back when I first was in the ministry. Her name was Beulah. And she was, a, I don't know if you ever met Beulah, but wonderful lady. And she said to me one day, she says, you know, God told me I'm to be your intercessor and pray for you every day, Pastor Kerry, so that God completes his work in you and whatever he has to do for you. And I, I was just flabbergasted because she did. The key to Smith Wigglesworth's power is everybody used to ask him, what is the key to your power? You only have a fifth grade education. What is the deal here? And he says, let me show you. And so he took a couple of people and a reporter, walked them around his place. They used to have cellars where you had to enter the cellar through the outside. And you opened the door and you went down the steps into the cellar. He opened the door and he, they walked down the steps and he says, you see these 30 people? There's another 30 every day that are praying for this work. Pushing back darkness so light can move with power. So the key to your walk and your health is your prayer life. God rewards those that diligently seek him. Well, what if I sin? I don't care. You're a son of God. God doesn't care about your messy britches. Get in there and talk to him. Unless you wear them all day and get a rash. 
<laughs> and believe me, there's a lot of Christians running around with rashes. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> All right. <sighs> you stop that mic. Amen. <laughs> okay. Colossians 1, 17 and 18 tells us why we meet with God first. Verse 17, Colossians 1, 17 says, And he is before all things. And in him all things are held together like glue. He is the head of the body, which is the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. He rose first, so we have life. That all things he may have the preeminence. You see, preeminence is... If our president or a king or somebody you really, really respected, okay, let's put it that way, walks in to be preeminent is to treat them like a king. Is to get a seat for them. Can I get you your meal? You see, preeminent. God is preeminent. Before you think, before you do too much, meet with the preeminence. All right, say Amen. Okay, that's God confirming. All right, so let's go on. Okay, a couple of points. We are coming to him and keep on coming to him. Some of you, because of your walk, you need to come to him almost all day until he straightens out a lot of stuff. Some of us have a life. I know I was pretty fortunate in some things because of prayer through my grandma and all. But some of us have had tough lives, really tough lives. But God got you this far. And God is going to get you all the way. He said you're going to the other side. But how can you do it if you don't have God in your boat? If you don't consult with your captain? You're not feeling well, why don't you talk to your physician? You need some counsel? Counsel? Well, why don't you talk to the counselor? But no. We get on the phone and ask somebody else. What's God telling you? Hello? Hello? What's God telling you? How come you're not talking? God's not telling me nothing. <laughs> don't seek answers from people unless you sought God first. Any amens? Amen. Really? How many's ever bought a lemon car? Guaranteed you did it without God. <laughs> Moving right on. So we meet with God first. Key. Healthy walk. Meet with God first. Two. Abide in his word. Everyone say abide. When you abide at home, what are you doing? You're staying home. You're in the home. Right? When you abide in the word, what are you? You're abiding in the word. And here's the thing. The Bible says you're supposed to be a doer of it. So if it says abide in the word, then you better need to. Because you want to. Because you love God. Because you have a relationship with him. So God, here's the thing. God needs the word in you. Do you know why? Because he brings us out of ourselves by his word. So if we don't have any word in us, he can't bring us out into the glories that he asked for us very much. And here's the, here's the trick of the enemy. Instead of giving us his word, he gives us religion. So no matter what we do, we seem like we're okay. But religion is a placebo. It's not the real thing. It feels like the real thing. It looks like the real thing. But if you really get in there, it stinks like a grave with dead bones. Peter went up and saw Jesus transfigured. And the biggest thing he could say was, let's build three tabernacles. Where's the spirituality? Jesus had to impart it to us. He has to give it to us by spending time with him. All right, abide in the word. Would you take and go to this scripture? John chapter 15, 7 and 8. I'll come, Pastor Kerry. Your sermons are just not 20 minutes long, and then we can get out of here. Because your life is far more worth 
more than that. And listen, a little 10 cent tip's not going to get you through the meal. All right, so you with me? All right, John 15 says, if you abide or dwell with me, dwell in me, you do. How many are in God? We all are if you're born again. And my words abide in you. In other words, you, you, you treat them healthy and you treat them holy. It, the word is God, remember? Okay. You abide in me and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire. Oh, there's a heavy. Are you telling me, Pastor Kerr, I could just ask anything God's going to do? it? No. Did you hear what he said? Ask what you desire. Where does desire come from? Your head? It comes right out of your spirit. Those of you who have really listened to the desires God put in your heart will guide you completely into freedom. See, it's that desire, God. So God will give you your desires. Your desires won't be for self. It'll be for him. God, make me a better pastor. I know you've been praying that. <laughs> make me a better pastor. Change me, Lord. I want to be able to say things that cause people to want to know you more. They want to walk with you more. To realize how much you really love them. That's what I want to share. I don't want to tell people the obvious. You better clean up your act. Amen. Have the same six people come to the altar every Sunday. Because they feel guilty. And they, they don't, nobody's taught them how to do the word. They're just guilty because they haven't done anything. That's sad. God doesn't want us to be that way. We live with Almighty God. He dwells in us. So let's move on. All right. Amen. Look at this. It says, abide in my words, abide in you. By this my Father is glorified. That his word abides in you. That you bear much fruit. And so shall you be my disciples. You can't bear fruit if you're not in the word. Hello. All you'll bear is trouble and testings. Satan knows you're not in the word. And so he'll test you. Just to make a mockery out of Christian people. So remember, the tempter does come. But you have a sword that's sharp right out of space when he comes too close. Call the word of God, the sword of the spirit. All right. So listen to what Psalms 138 says, verse 2. How many know there's no other name given among men to be saved? What's that name? Jesus, right? How many know that there's something God honors above his name? His word. Psalms, are you with me? 138, verse 2. For you have magnified and honored your word above your name. How many here believe that when you give your word, your word is you? That's what God is saying here. God gave his word. His word is him. And he honors what he said more than who he is. Do you understand that? He's saying, I want you to know I'm not going to ever lie to you. I'm never going to tell you something that isn't true. But you got to be with me so you can hear as the Spirit teaches the word. And not as religion wants to make excuses. Well, you never know what God's going to do. His mysteries are past searching out. You heard all that junk? Yes, it says that in there. But it's talking Old Testament. As long as they weren't born again, there's no searching out. Remember, first scriptures I gave you is, if you get born again, you can perceive and understand the kingdom. If you're not born again, it's all going to be a mystery to you. You'll be closed out of doing. That's why we have all kinds of problems out there. These professors of their, I'm a Christian, they mean they're American. They never made peace with God. I don't want a non-born again man or woman operating on me. I don't want a non-born again man or woman leading my country. We had a born again man. Not perfect. I want godly women and godly men. You understand? At least I can understand they have the God that we serve in their heart and they reverence him. Moving right off of that. Don't want to get into any politics here. 
We'll have to go to Rumble. No. <laughs> you guys, what's the matter with you? Are you all right? We're just watching you, Pastor Curry. We've got our eyes on you. All right, so, so God honors his word above his name. So if you get filled with the word, you're in the word every day. What testament do we read first? New, because the old one is obsolete, the Bible says. It's good. We can learn from it. But it doesn't give us truth of God dwelling in us. All right. Not only that, but you need to study Jesus, what he says, what he does. Study Jesus, what he says and what he does, how he responds. Study Jesus. Study Jesus. I got a book in my closet that says everything Jesus said and did. It's listed out. Christ for the nations. You can order it. All his miracles, everything, all lined out. So you can study how he responded. Because Jesus said, the works that I do, shall you do also. And even greater works than these shall you do. John 14, 12. All right, so let's go on. Every day, our focus, if we're going to have a healthy walk, every day, our focus is on who? All right, get your eyes off the world. I, why? It's passing away. It's full of lies and deceit and corruption. Even though we're in the world, we're not of the world, right? So if we look to the world for answers, you're going to be terribly disappointed. That's what Satan is. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm doing. Blowing up people and killing people. And then second, we don't put our eyes on men. Because man always wants to be important and if you got get a godly or woman or a man they're very humble not trying to be important but they always speak truth and truth for people who lie all the time is very troubling because it's exposing moving right along all right so focusing on jesus second corinthians chapter three i'll call it for you verse 18 says we all everyone say we all with an open face are looking at Jesus. We're being changed into his image from glory to glory. So when you get up in the morning, you focus on Jesus. What do I do? Get a picture of Jesus and put it in front of my face. Let's build three tabernacles. <laughs> you know why he's here? Some guy made that for me and everything. It's beautiful. Worth thousands and thousands of dollars. I can't formulate in my heart to throw it away. This does not really show a good picture of Jesus. But it is the picture I know of Jesus when I saw him in a vision. But I put him on there as a reminder. Our focus is on who? Jesus, right? So we don't put our attention on people because people will let you down. And you can get mad at people and you don't want to do that. So I have all kinds of people who promise me things all the time. And I put, I, this is how I look at it. I says, well, okay, well, amen. If it happens, it happens. If it don't, don't. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Amen. Sometime I'll tell you about the millions of dollars were pledged to me. Lady pledged $3 million when our church was sold, not, not years ago, years ago. And here's what happens with money. She, she became a widower and her husband was killed by irresponsibility. So she got a huge. Uh, and so she said. Pastor I'm going to give you that. I said, don't say that. <laughs> Satan catches wind. That you're going to give the church money. He's going to hit you. You can give it to anything else. But don't give it to a church. Especially ones that preach. And well of course you know what happened. The enemy brought in somebody in her life. And he was one of those chip and dailies. You know could have words he looked like a fox and he made her feel like a queen and of course took all of her money i saw her a couple of years later just weeping and crying you know since then it's been all cool and everything is great but i think you got to realize if you're a christian bragging and boasting and stuff is exactly what tracks the devil to take from you okay we don't want that. You want a healthy walk. Say amen. So you keep your eyes off of people. 
And then you keep your eyes off of the big problem. Yourself. I'm not getting, I'm not working. It's not working for me. It me, me, me. I'm me, 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 me. I will, I will. I'm going to, I'm going to. How many eyes are in your conversation during the day? Just think about it. I'm not picking on you. I'm just trying to analyze your eyes. Because you don't want your eyes on you. Can you say amen? little pun there for you. All right. But our eyes are to be on who? Jesus Christ. Because as we learn to focus on him, when we're in prayer, he's changing us into the same image. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 12 and we're finishing. Okay. Verse 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded with so many clouds of witnesses. People have gone on. You and I are all witnesses to one another. Let us lay aside every weight, the things in our life that slow us down, and the sin, missing the mark, and doing it our way, so that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father on high. You see, when Christians look of all the oppositions and all the things that come against them, their eyes are in the wrong place. Don't put them back on Jesus, because even when Jesus knew he had to go to the cross, Jesus would be completely forsaken by all of his disciples, Judas, everything like that, Jesus' focus was the end result. How about your focus today? God's not done with you yet. You're still under construction, so be careful criticizing anybody else. Get in before God and let God make those wonderful things in your life a reality. Only he could do it. I can encourage you along the way, and my wife will do that too. We encourage one another. But get with your God. He's the one that creates all that wonderful things. Now listen to this. Our walk is a walk with Christ. Not a walk for Christ. Our walk is a walk with Christ. Not for Christ. Just a small change Satan works on. So as long as you're walking with Jesus, guess what? God's in you. You're in God. God is for you. God is with you. Are you seeing the picture? You're focusing on that. You're meeting with God. You're doing all those things. He's breathing so much health and strength in you. You make sure of those negative thoughts that always say, well, yeah. Why do you think that you deserve any of this? Remember what you did yesterday and what you said to that person there? Don't be listening to that. <laughs> Don't you know why the enemy says that? Once you get a, a beautiful, beautiful service in the Lord and then all of a sudden through the afternoon, Satan starts throwing stuff at you. He's just coming to steal. And guess what? He can't if you don't let him. All right. Listen to this. This is from the Message Bible. I like the Message Bible. I don't, all, I don't use it for my studies, but I use it to kind of point out a little bit more modern language. So, this is the love chapter. How important it is to have a healthy walk is we have to walk in love. And who is love? God is love. Can you say amen? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7, the Message Bible. If I speak with human eloquence... And angels like ex ecstasy and don't love, I'm nothing but a cracking of a nasty gate. <laughs> Hello. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as a day, if I have faith and say to this mountain, jump, and it jumps. But don't have love. I am nothing. Verse 3. If I give everything I own to the poor. Even if I go to this, the stake to be burned. As a martyr. But if I don't love. I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say. What I believe. Or what I do. 
I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Say amen, everybody. That's why when you fall, no, I, I don't care if you fall. I care that you get up. Everybody in Christianity, you go back 20 years, there was a lot of people falling because a lot of people had pride. I did. I fell hard. But you know what? It's not the falling because we all fall and stumble. It's how God helps us to get up. Helps us to plan. We are walking with Jesus. I mean, did you tell your little infant kid, now don't bother the fall, because if you do, I'm going to disown you. Why has the church done that? I'm going to tell you, when I fell, I went to a church and I asked for help. I got a nasty letter. We don't want you around. Went to the second church I helped grow. And he told me, get on my knees and cough up devils in the sack. And he handed me a bag. These are big churches, okay? The third church I went to, he told me to leave town. And so I was away from God. I'm going to tell you what I did. I threw eggs at his house. And then I asked God to forgive me. <laughs> he got egged. Tell me to leave town. Why? He had people in his church that belonged to my church. They're not my people. They're just God's. Do you understand? But I was all set up, puffed up, full of pride. I was going to be somebody. At least that's what everybody thought. <laughs> but only God makes us somebody. Can you say amen? And when everything fell apart, my mom got Lou Gehrig's disease, started dying on me, and I saw all the other situations going. I only knew what I needed to do. I needed to be with God. I needed to seek his wisdom. You know where I really got help? Is when I left this state and went down into California where they didn't know me and they ministered to my heart and restored me. And that really is a bad omen to the churches in this area because many of them I hobnobbed with and palled around with. I can drop you so many names, make your head spin. But that's not the point. The point is that you walk, your walk with the Lord is rich. And it's deep and it's healthy. And you understand how it works. You understand there's two of you. There's a flesh you and there's a spirit you. Always, the one you feed the most is going to win. It won't keep you from being saved. But it'll certainly keep you from tremendous rewards. So, did you know God rewards his children? So let's read the rest of this. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for their self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. You guys know what strutting is, don't you? Okay, you got it. All right. Modern language. Here we go. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelling head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score of the sins of others. You did this. You did this. You did this. You, I remember this when you did this. Really? Doesn't revile when others grovel against you. When others grovel against you, it doesn't revile back. Takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Puts up with anything. Trusts God always. Always looks for the best. Never looks back but keeps going until the end. Isn't that a good little message there? So, God first, nothing else. Two, word. Be in the word a little bit every day so God can breathe life and bring you out of yourself. Thirdly, keep your focus on Jesus. You're walking with him, not for him. I'm in the ministry with him. This is God's church. So he adds to the church daily as he gets set. The scripture says, except the Lord build the church, they that labor, labor in vain. So Lord, you just do your thing and I'll listen to my part of that thing. And you listen to your part of that thing. And you watch us grow and develop. You watch God do many, many miracle things until he comes. 
you got something out of that, will you give the Lord a praise? Amen.